about exception safe coding. And uh, I want to tell you that I have a website devoted to this. It's called Exception Safe Code. It has a bibliography for uh, all the material I'm presenting here. And so if you want to do more reading, it's a great, great place to start. It has a video of a previous version of this talk. The previous version doesn't have any of the C++ 11 stuff, so all the C++ 11 stuff is new. And um, uh, I hope to have links to this video once we get it available there. So this is the site, if you're interested in exception safe code, this is a good place to go to. Um, I have links to comments to people who made about the uh, about my video, but I really appreciate having more. So if you guys, whether it's you know positive or negative, <laughs> Of course, I like the positive ones, but either way, send me send me comments about the talk, and, and uh, I'll put you in the lab. Um, okay. So here's my contact. You can write me at Exception Safe Code, John at Exception Safe Code. Uh, I do have a Twitter. John Calp seems to have taken. So Jonathan Calp. I only tweet technical stuff, so I won't. No, I promise you, I'm never going to tweet that I took my wife out to dinner or something. That's not it's just technical stuff. And. Uh, if you want to send your resume to John Calb at A9.com, uh, A9 is a company that takes C++ pretty seriously, so that's why I'm there. If you're thinking about it, that's where you want to send your resume. So um, I want to dedicate this talk to the great teacher of exception safe code. So many of you know that a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, Yoda was teaching Jedi Knights how to use the Force. But what a lot of people don't know is that right here in our galaxy today, Yoda is teaching C++ programmers how to use exception-safe coding to have forces in code. So here's the promise that I want to make today. And I want you guys to hold it to me because I think it's a very high promise. And here's the promise. The promise is that if you follow the guidelines that we present in these sessions, that the code you write will be easier to read. And by that, I mean easier to understand, easier to maintain. It'll be easier to write. It will have no time penalty. In some cases, it'll even be faster. And it'll be 100% robust in the face of exceptions. That's the promise. And that's what I want you to hold. So I did mention that um, the C++ 11 stuff here is new. So if I have this, if I don't have anything there, it means that it's, what I'm telling you should apply to both. And then I got this little C++03 uh, and C++2011, and if they're both up, it means that some part of the slide applies to each or something like that. Um, so I'm really solid on classic C++. Obviously, C++11 is pretty new. I think we all, if, if Howard can admit that he's not an expert, <laughs> then I can certainly admit that I'm not an expert. How about that? Um, but, the, but the thing is that there's fundamentally no change in exception safety. There's a lot of new twists and things like that, but we couldn't have one talk covering both if there were two completely different approaches. So fundamentally, exception safety is exception safety, and the, and the fundamental approach is both for both languages. Um, so as I said, there's some new material, and some of the material is no longer necessary. So I want to uh, I want to say, I used to start my STL talks, back when I was doing a lot of STL talks, and I would start it by saying, this talk is for three kinds of programs, three groups of people. Those who make up by one errors, and those who never make. But this talk really is for three kinds of people. And that is those people who don't care about C11 at all. They know that they're in O3 world, they're going to be there for a while. How many are in that group? Okay, a few of you. That's okay. But I mean, you're not even interested. You're not even interested in C11? You're interested. Of course you're interested. You wouldn't be at BoostCon. Okay, the other group is C11. That's it. O3 is in the rear view mirror. I'm using it. Modern compilers on modern code bases. I never have, none of my code has to look at 2003 again. I got one, two, oh, we got a few. All right. So the rest of you, I assume, kind of got one foot in both, right? We're trying to catch on the speed of 11, but got a lot of code that's got to work in O3, right? That's where you are? Oh. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, uh, I think that's going to be good for this talk. <laughs> so, so let's talk about what we're going to talk about. First of all, we're going to talk about the problem. What is it that exceptions are trying to solve? Uh, and then we're going to talk about some solutions that don't involve exceptions. Obviously, you don't need exceptions. Lots of languages don't have exceptions. Right? So, uh, so it is possible to, to solve the problem without exceptions. 
But we'll talk about those and some of the drawbacks to that. Then we'll talk about some of the problems that we have using exceptions, because there's, there's a reason that there's a crowd here, right? It's not necessarily trivial. And then we will talk about how not to write exception safe code. This is kind of the naive attempts that we, uh, are, are kind of going down the path before we really uh, we really figure out what we're going to do down here with the, the real exception safe coding guidelines. And that's the meat of the talk. That's the important stuff. However, then after that, we're going to talk about some implementation techniques. Once we know how to do this, knowing what we're, where we're trying to get is not the same thing as knowing how to get there. So the implementation techniques will include a, a few little things, but one of them is really important, and that is how do we take this legacy code base where exception safety wasn't the primary thought in mind of the people writing it, and how do we write in the world we'd like to be in, which is writing exception safe code? How do we get there? And uh, I have a little bit of information about how to do that. So let's first talk about what's the problem. And the reason this is uh, a more interesting question you might think is, Gernot Sturstrup, in, uh, in his book on uh, the development and evolution of C++, he talks about exceptions. And he mentions that there's a professor at Stanford by the name of David Sheridan. And he pointed out something. He says, you know, we say that functions in C++ can only have one return type. They can have different return values. But a given function is defined to have a return type. It returns int or double, but not sometimes int and sometimes double. But Sheridan said, well, that's not really true. You can have any return type you want. You just throw it. It's like having a function with multiple return types. Jarney doesn't think that's a good idea, and I think most people agree with him. I actually took Sheridan's class, and he did. He started out at the beginning of class. He mentioned this. He talked about using exceptions this way. But he never developed it. He never said anything more about it. From then on, in the entire class, we used exceptions in the traditional way, which is to, to handle errors. So uh, I think it's important to think about fundamentally, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And fundamentally what that problem is, is the separation of error detection from error handling. And no matter what kind of code you're writing in, in almost any language, this is a problem that you have to face. It looks something like this. So, whether you're actually writing an application or not, you may be writing a device driver or a CGI that the patch is going to call you, you know, anything. There is some logic that is the application logic. There's some high level logic that knows what you're trying to accomplish, knows how you communicate to the user, right? And then we have the low level code. And it's the low level code, it's where, you know, the electrons meet the road, so to speak. That's where we find out where errors are. That's where we find out, ooh. We can't write to this disk, it's out of space. Or we can't read this file, we don't have the right permission. Or guess what, this server's not here. And so here's the problem, that the low level implementation doesn't know how to talk to the user. And that's the way it should be, right? The low level implementation is in the reusable library. You don't want to have a library where you say, oh, well I wrote this library expecting it to be used by an iPhone app and it puts up iPhone notifications and man, I can't use that in anywhere else because then it does, no, they don't want that. We want libraries to be reusable. So the low-level library knows how to do what it needs to do and can detect errors that it can't, you know, runtime errors. But it's the code up here that knows, uh, knows how to tell the user that an error has happened. And in between, we have all these layers of code, right? And that's really what we're trying to, trying to solve. Because what we have is the implementation down here sees an error. Up here, hey, this knows how to tell the user, oh, you know that document you wanted to print? Guess what? That's not going to happen. But the problem is, how does this guy communicate all the way up here? That's the problem that we're trying to solve. Now, we don't need exceptions to do this, right? We can solve this in other ways. Let's talk about some other ways. I'm going to call out two, and I think this is pretty much the other alternatives. You could imagine other kinds of ways, but let's talk about these two. Um, one of them called, what I call, these are my terms, error flagging, and I think we turn to those, right? So what's error flagging? Error flagging is any situation where your code has to do something positive to find out that some error is happening. So we may have some place that we look, like error no, we say, oh, was there an error? We look at the value there. Sometimes we have a function we call in the Mac, I'm a Mac guy, so the Mac OS you call git res error to find out was there some error with the resource name, right? Uh, so here's an example of how you'd use error no. If you look at, this is a POSIX function, git priority. And the documentation says, set error no to zero before you call it, and then check error no. Right? 
So what are the problems with this approach? Well, the most obvious one to me is errors can be ignored. In fact, by default, errors are ignored. If you don't do something, the error is ignored. Your code has to affirmatively go out and do something to make sure there's no error. All right. And then there is the possibility that there could be ambiguity. Remember in the example we just looked at, you had to remember to set zero first and then call the function. So if later on you do some maintenance and you add another function after you set zero, well, then we're not sure which function actually set there. So there can be ambiguity about what the failure was. And another big problem with it is that the code is tedious to read and write. I mean, if every single time you do something, you check and say, gosh, what's the error? That ends up being a lot of lines of code. And you can find out that you have more lines of code dealing with errors than there are actual lines doing them. Yeah. Um, I would say that's an exceptional case. Almost all the uh, functions you'll call return an error code if an error can happen. I mean, not necessarily an error code, but an indication of an error. And then if you want further information, you check error node. Um, yeah. Well, error node is just one example. I mean, that's just one way that you can check stuff. You can sometimes call functions, like I say, get res error or something. Yeah, much more common is to use return codes, right? And this is a situation where um, we use return values where there's some error code. And usually, you know, every API returns this code and lets you know that there's some problem. Um, and usually we define a bunch of, you know, so these are known values. And um, every, uh, when a function detects this, it needs to make certain that it relays that back up. So what are the issues here? Well, it turns out they're actually pretty, sim pretty similar. Again, errors can be ignored, right? It's a return value. You don't do anything with it. You know, in Pascal, you have to use a return value. But in C or C++, you can just completely ignore a return value. But even if you had to take it, you still don't have to do anything with it. Uh, in fact, by default, you won't do anything with it. And then, if you have these, these calls that are relayed up the chain, if you have a call that's uh, careless about errors, it may not relay it up the chain, and then you kind of just drop the error. But again, this is a little, you know, same thing again. We're having to do something every time we do something. So that means there's lots of lines of code that are dealing with error. So it turns out that exceptions take care of both these problems. You can't ignore it, and it turns out that it's not um, tedious right. The thing is, exceptions have some, some issues of their own. So let's talk about this a little bit. Yoda says, broken error handling leads to bad states. Bad states lead to bugs. Bugs lead to suffering. Yoda's such a bright up. Um, it turns out that using exceptions is no exception to this. We still have to watch the broken error states. So let me show you this example of some code here. Um, so this is a function as a container. It's assignment operator for a container. It does check for self-assignment, right? Uh, and then once we know that there's no self, because it, it's just a no op if it's self-assignment. Otherwise, we need to uh, destroy this one and renew ourselves in place with a copy of the right-hand side value, right? So what's wrong with this? New may fail. So, okay, new fails, because this is calling a copy constructor, right? And copies always can fail, they can throw. Uh, in the in general case, some objects, you know, copy might not, but this is templated on generic objects, so some of them might throw in the copy. And if that copies, what happens? We've left this object destroyed. Um, now, why did I show you this code? Um, this is just one bad, broken thing. It's also very old. This is trying to reuse destructors and constructors in place. Nobody does that anymore, but that was kind of the trend many years ago. This code actually um, was written by, really, one of my programming idols. Uh, this was written by uh, Alex Stepanov, the creator of the STL. And he made the point, he was talking about this and made a point of this, and he said this is the way this code was in the first four years of the original implementation of the STL. And that was a time when he was showing all the experts in C++ saying, look at my library, what's wrong with it? You know, doing the proof of concept, trying to get people to look at it. And for four years, the experts in C++ looked at this, and they didn't notice what John just figured out in about 30 seconds, which is, gosh, if that throws, we're screwed. So, you know, I've talked to Alex about this. By the way, Alex works at A9. And uh, if you'd like to come to the company where Alex and I work, I'm going to send your resume to johncow at a9.com. 
<laughs> you might want to write that down because I promise I'll probably only repeat that about four more times. <laughs> um, so I talked to Alex about this, and as I said, he pointed this out himself. He did a talk or a paper, I'm not sure even where I got this. I think it was in a paper he wrote where he used this example. Um, and my point is, again, not that Alex is a bad programmer or anything like that. My point is just that we've learned a lot about exceptions. As an industry, we now can spot in 30 seconds what we used to not see in four years. Um, but I talked to Alex about this, and he actually told me, he said, you know, I didn't really write this code myself. Alex is a mathematician kind of guy. He said, I work with people who are C++ experts. He used to work at Bell Labs, so he worked with and all those guys. And I won't name names, but he told me who he thinks gave him this code. Because he said, well, how would I write the assignment? I guess, oh, do this. So, and, um, so this is kind of the dark side. The other thing I want to talk about is myself, because um, you guys probably can't see it in this light, but I actually have a little bit of gray hair. I've been doing this for a long time. And when I started programming in C++, people told me, oh yeah, C++, that, that's cool stuff. You do this encapsulation and stuff. But don't use exceptions and don't use templates. Because those are kind of the dark corners. Uh, there's implementation and performance issues and maybe portability issues. and all. So if you stay away from those, oh yeah, C++ is great stuff. So what did I know, right? Um, in fact, those, some of those things were legitimate and were concerns. Um, and I think that may have put people off. And so it's been causing people to be slow to adopt to exceptions. Of course, as I said, this is for people a long time ago. Um, today's implementations, they don't have those issues. Today's compilers, reliable, performant, portable, those issues are behind us. That fear and uncertainty, I hope we can, we can put that behind us. But, um, but there are things that concern people today, and one of them is, uh, in fact, a big one probably is code path disruption. So almost any programming, there are exceptions, but almost any programming language has this one very important convention, which is a line of code is executed, and then we do the next line, and then we do the next line. We may have control structures and stuff like that, but the idea is we do this, and then this, and then this, and then this. And the reason they're all like that is because that's just such a human natural thing. That's what we expect. And if you're calling functions, and then suddenly the function you thought you were going to be executing next isn't executing, that can be a little weird for people. Um, what it really means is that, that, remember we said that error conditions can't be ignored. Well, the flip side of not being able to ignore them is that essentially every function you call, if it has exceptions that it might throw, it has an invisible return. There's a, there's a magical return that happens, and we don't see it. And that puts people off. It's like, well, wow, that, that scares me a little bit. That's OK. That's because they haven't been here and listened to this. So I want to talk a little about Tom Carlyle. He wrote a, a very influential and important article. And in it, he said, counterintuitively, the hard part of coding exceptions is not the explicit throws and catches. In other words, it's not detecting the error, and it's not handling the error. He said, the really hard part of using exceptions is to write all the intervening code in such a way that an arbitrary exception can propagate from its throw site to its handler, arriving safely without damaging all the other parts of the program along the way. What I say is, you know, this is really true of any error handling system. It's really difficult to be consistent about propagating errors from the low level to the high level. And the reason that we worry so much about exceptions but don't worry about other approaches is because we very seldom are consistent with those other approaches. We don't realize how hard that is to really be that consistent. The thing is that, that Carl's article, which is called Exception Handling, uh, False Sense of Security, what he did was he took a stack class that had been published. It was written to be published by David, David Reed. He wrote this article saying, here's how to use templates. And oh, by the way, there's some exceptions in here too. And what happened was Carl analyzed it, and he pointed out a bunch of problems with the class. But he didn't have a solution. And, and so here's, what, here's the, where he got stuck. Here's the stack class, right? Here's the pop method. The pop method checks to see if we're not empty, because we can't pop if we're empty. And it throws if we are. And then it does a return of what's at the top of the stack, and it changes the top point. Right? So what's wrong with this? Why is this not exceptional? Yeah, we are. Because you're going to be changing the state of the object uh, if there's a possible exception on the copy of the return value. Right, right. So what he was saying is that 
if we have an exception when this thing is copied, because that's what's going to happen. We're returning this, so it's going to be a by value return, and that's going to call a copy constructor. And as we've been saying, copy constructors can throw, right? So it's possible that it throws, but if it does that, you've already changed top. So you've already lost the top item, right? And so what he's saying is, if this throws on the copy, you've permanently lost, there's no way to do, to try again, right? That's it, it's gone. And so that's what he's saying. And, and what he said, I don't know how to fix that. I don't know how to fix that. You know, it's the interface itself is the problem. But let's think about this for a second. There's a stack class in the standard, right? There's an adapter. You can, you can use stack as, an, as a container adapter, stack on vector or adapter or something like that. And it obviously has to be able to solve this problem. Is it not exception safe? How does the standard solve this problem? Yeah, right. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure, but I, I believe it's the pop and back are separate operations. It's it's uh, it's uh, pop and top. Okay. So the idea is that you call one to get the value. Notice pop just returns void. Right? So we do it in two steps. We do one step, the step that could throw. We do that. If it throws, you still have the chance to do it again. Maybe you need to free up some memory, or maybe there's some other reason that the throw failed that you could fix. And you don't ever call pop until you're certain that you don't need that value anymore. That's the solution to the problem. That solves the problem. The reason Cardinal couldn't solve the problem is he was constrained. He said, oh, I've got to be able to live within this API, and I've got to be able to have this guarantee that you can always get the object even if copied. So this article caused people to say things like, oh, look, he proved that exceptions aren't safe. Or some people say, oh, he proved that exceptions and templates can't mix. And this caused just a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. A lot of people, you know, on top of whatever implementation problems there might have been in, in exceptions, it just caused people, no, no, we can't, we can't go there. But the thing is, that's not really what he said. He didn't say exceptions weren't safe. He didn't even say they were hard to use. That may have been implied, but he didn't actually say that. What he did say is he didn't have all the answers. So what he was saying when he wrote this article in 94, he's saying, we don't know how to be exceptions. Fortunately, <laughs> we do now. How many of you were at the, at the grilling committee last year? Or last night, sorry. Yeah, and what did Dave say? Why did Dave say that he joined the committee? Because the library wasn't exception safe and he wanted to make it exception safe. And, and we know how to do that, right? So this is what Dave says. Exception handling isn't hard. Error handling is hard. Exceptions make it easier. Let's, let's find out why they're easier. But first I want to talk to Joel just a little bit. How many of you know Joel's philosophy and read Joel on something? A few of you. OK. So you might remember this. He had this blog way back in 2005. And um, I was reading, it was called Making Code Look Wrong, and the, and the point of, the, of it was to adopt coding style such that if something was wrong, it would stand out, it would look wrong, right? And one of the examples he used, this was a little code example, and uh, what he said is, okay, so he said, you know, this looks, this looks good to people because they know, okay, I'm going to do something and I'm going to clean up, but again, what is it that we do as, as humans? We read line by line, we hope to think this will be executed and this will be executed. But he said, you know what? If do something, this can only be safe if we look inside do something and find out if it throws. And then we need to look inside anything do something calls and find out if that throws, et cetera, et cetera. And then we need to look in our crystal wall and find out if anybody in the future is ever going to modify do something so that it throws. So he didn't think we had good enough crystal walls, so his conclusion is exceptions are extremely dangerous. You see why he says this. But here's the thing. When I, uh, when I was reading the, the blog, which is fairly long, and this is kind of toward the bottom. So I'm reading along, and I'm scrolling up. And once this scrolls into view, I immediately read it. It's only two lines of code, but it was code, so it's kind of set off. And I don't even know what he's talking about. All I do is I read this. And as soon as I saw it, I said to myself, well, that code's written wrong. And, and that's, what, that's what's going to happen to you guys today. <laughs> because when you're finished with this, as soon as you see code like that, you're going to immediately say, well, that code's written wrong. 
We'll come back to Joel. We'll come back. First, I want to talk about what are the first steps we want to do when we want to start to write exception city code. So back when I had less gray hair, if you had asked me and said, John, how do we write exception state code? Well, I would have been honest, and I would say, well, I don't know really how to get all the way there, but I know how to start. These are the first steps. First thing is, we need, to, we need to check those return values. We need to know what the error codes mean and, and how we're going to remedy the situation. The other thing is, we need to find out which functions we're going to throw, because those kind of have to be you know, mentally quarantined. We've got to worry about those. Those are, the, those are the troubles. Those are the problematic ones. And I say, but the, 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 the standard defines exception specifications that we can put on, on functions which tell us uh, what, what they can throw, what they can't throw. So we'll use the compiler to help us write this code. And then the last thing I would have said is, and then we're going to use these uh, try-catch blocks to control our code. The thing is, that's really hard to do that. I'm not going to say that it's always impossible, but I'm going to say it's usually impossible. In fact, I'm going to go farther. I'm going to say that's the wrong way. Don't do it that way. This is leading you down the wrong path. Yoda would say, you must unlearn what you've learned. If this is what you're thinking, this is how we get to exception safe code, then, then I've got great news for you because I've got a much easier way that's actually going to work. So what's the right way? Well, the right way is, instead of thinking about code paths, we're going to think about our code structurally. And, and focus not on code paths and what happens, but focus on maintaining the invariants. We have an object that's got a certain invariants. Things aren't going to leak. Things aren't going to get in that bad state. And we're going to maintain that. We're going to make sure no matter where we might throw, that's going to happen. That's what we're going to do. So let's get to it. This is the exception safe guidelines. Few enough that will fit on one slide. Some of the guidelines are hard requirements. If you're going to write robust code, you've got to do this. Some of them are just my advice. And, and if you follow my advice, what happens if you follow my advice? What did I promise? Easier to read, easier to write, fast, and robust. So let's get to it. So the first place we're going to start is we're going to talk a little bit about what Dan Abrams did when he was talking about the standard library, and he developed the, the guarantees, the exception safety guarantees. So the first one is basic. That is, the invariants of a component are preserved and no resources are left. So maybe we're trying to add something to a container or add a whole bunch of things to a container. If an exception happens, if an exception is thrown, what do we know? Well, we may not know what's in the container. We may have copied some things and not others. We may have copied all but one, or we may have failed trying to copy. We don't know what's in the container. That guarantee is not there. What's guaranteed is that the containers, uh, the invariants, are still there. We haven't leaked any resources. And if we need to, we can ask the container how many items it has. We can call its destructor. It's still a valid container. The strong guarantee says if an exception is thrown, there are no effects. So if we try to add something to a, a container and an exception is thrown, nothing has changed in the container. It's exactly the same state as before we threw it. And then the last guarantee is that for this function, there will be no exceptions emitted. Now I want to talk about something. Um, when, we, when I say emitted, all of these things are about interfaces. When I talk about preserving the invariants, we invalidate invariants all the time. That's what we do when we write code. We come into a function, and we do things that invalidate the invariants. We restore them before we return. So from the outside look, that's what we're talking about, the interface. So when I say a function is no throw, that doesn't mean there's no exceptions being thrown. That means there's no exceptions being emitted. Inside the function, I may throw and then catch. Okay? And so the same thing is true about these others. We may, in fact, have temporary violations of invariants, but we know that when the function returns or when a throw happens, those invariants are restored. Yeah, we are. Are you going to, by any chance, get to the uh, idea that no throw is misnamed? Um, oh, that... we are going to have lots of fun with no throw. Okay. Well, I've come to the conclusion it should be called no fail, and I'm not the person that originated that, but, you know, what, what that really, it, it's more useful to me to think of that as this won't fail. It will always succeed regardless of what happens in terms of exceptions. Otherwise, right. the whole thing falls apart, right? Okay, but I want to uh, show you just a little bit about what Yoda thinks about the, the strong. Uh, what Yoda says is do or do not. 
In other words, for those of you that recognize this, you know, database program, whatever, what is it? It's a mm -hmm. transaction. That's what we say. It's a transaction. Either it happens or it doesn't happen. So what do we learn from, uh, what are our assumptions based on these guarantees? Well, first of all, we will assume the basic guarantee. Now, it's not because I naively believe that there's no functions out there that, that in the case of an exception, they might not violate invariance. That's not the point. The point is, we absolutely have to make this assumption because if your code doesn't fulfill the basic guarantee, you can't write robust. Forget exception save code, forget any of the cool stuff I'm going to show you, all that kind of stuff. Forget it. If you don't have the basic guarantee, you're already screwed. That's priority zero is to get to the basic guarantee. That's what you need to fix. You have to be there. Right? So that's the reason we assume it. It's not so much that it's really true, although I hope you're not in that hell. But the reason we assume it is because if you can't make that assumption, the game's already over before you start. The other thing we're going to assume is that unless we know otherwise, code throws. Now that may really freak some people out because they're coming from that mindset where say, well, let's minimize the, the functions that throw or let's make sure we know which ones throw. And the idea that well, basically everything throws, that's really scary. But don't worry. We're okay with this. I'll show you. All right. So now we're going to talk about the mechanics of C++, and by that, what I mean is um, the, the language syntax, the low-level stuff. So some of you guys know this stuff cold. You can go to sleep, but uh, I'm going to go through it all anyway, just in case. I, I think there might be a, a thing or two that we can learn by looking closely at what the standard actually says. So let's first talk about throw. Um, so we, we can create some object and then throw that object, right? So we detect, this is all about error detection, we detect an error, then we make the exception, and then we throw. So my first question is, is this object thrown? Didn't I just say it was? No, why not? The, 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 the uh, standard is very clear that a copy is thrown, right? Now, it's possible that the compiler can elide that copy, but what it means to us is that this has to be copyable. You can't throw, you can't throw a single. Right? So can we throw a pointer? Yes, sure. The problem with throwing a pointer, suppose we did that. Suppose we said throw at object. What's the problem with that? That's right. We've just given somebody a pointer to something that's no longer in scope. It's a dangly pointer. That's a bad thing. Now, we could give somebody a pointer to a global thing or something allocated on the heap. The problem with it is that the person getting the pointer might not know if it's a global thing or a thing allocated on the heap. So they don't know to free it. So it turns out that throwing a bad, throwing a pointer is possible, but probably not a great idea. What about throwing a reference? Supposedly guarantees the object's there. Well, the point is syntactically you can't say you can't throw a reference. I mean, you know, if if this was a reference to something, what it would be throwing is the actual thing. It's gonna make a copy of the actual thing. So syntactically you can't throw a reference. Although my friend Nevin, when I showed him my slides, he said, well, there actually is a way to throw a reference. So we'll talk about whether or not he's, he's talking about uh, something too minuscule to be worried about. So here's the situation, and this is the really the more common thing. I showed you where we created an exception and then threw it. This is way more common. We almost always create a temporary, right? We create a temporary and throw it. Now, let's think about up here. We have another local thing here. Um, so S is a, is a string, and I hope that is big enough to not be in any uh, short string optimization. So we have allocated a buffer with a bunch of characters in it, right? Now, if we don't release that buffer, we're going to have a memory. So where does that buffer normally get released? Well, in the destructor, right? That's the destructor of S, right? And where does that happen? That happens down here, right? Except we're never going to get down here. We're going to throw here, right? So do we have a leak? No. No, because because the standard says, when we throw, we will clean up everything that's local at the time we throw. In fact, that happens in layers. So if we go through several layers before we get to a catch, they'll all be clean. All right, so let's talk about the catch. So this is what the catch syntax looks a little like. Uh, Bjarni points out that try is completely unnecessary. The only reason try is there is because when you try to explain exceptions to people, they couldn't understand it until he put a try there. But 
the compiler could certainly say, oh, I've got a catch here, then this brace here must be a thing that I'm trying. Try is completely necessary. But the language says it's going to be there, so it's going to be there. All right, so we say try, something that might throw, and then we have what we call catch blocks. I know, you guys know all this. You can go to it. Um, so one catch block only will be executed, and possibly none. And if none is executed, then we will blow past this try, and we'll try to look for an enclosing try that also has catch blocks. Now, if there's a match between the exception that was thrown and what's in this catch, this works like a function argument, meaning that this is the type of the exception, and this is how we'll refer to it within the code block. And so we can do something that uses this, right? We also have something called a catch-all, and that's these three dots. And uh, by the way, I use ellipses a lot in my pseudocode here to show you, oh, uh, more code. And they'll be white if I use that. This is actual real code, so it's yellow. Um, so in this case, what we're saying is, I don't care what you throw, catch it, and then I'm not going to, I can't refer to that. I'll have to write code that doesn't use that. Okay? Um, you can have, you must have one catch block, you can have any number of catch blocks. The catch all must come last, and the reason is that the catches are tried one at a time until the compiler finds uh, one that matches the exception. So you can have a, a number of different things you can try to catch an int and a double and blah, blah, blah. And there's a, uh, and then it will take the first one to the case. Okay. So uh, let's drill down a little bit where I said this works like a, like a parameter here. Um, if this was a function parameter, and we were looking at this, we would say that that's by value, right? And when you take something by value, what does that mean? There's a copy going on. Well, there's a couple of issues with copies. One is there's a performance issue, right? So you might not want to copy. But it turns out, we're throwing an exception anyway. We're long beyond performance. So we don't care about that. But there is an issue of slicing, right? And what does that mean? Well, it turns out that just like you can do with a, an object, if I take, if I have a function, and the function takes base class object by value, I can call that function and pass it a derived class object. And what's going to happen is I'm going to see a copy from the derived class to a base class. And it's, we call it slicing. All the derived uh, functionality and data is gone. And what I took is just the base class. Slicing is almost never what you want to see. So, so it turns out that we kind of have issues with the way that works. On the other hand, if we catch by reference, it's actually possible to modify the exception. And then, now this is the new syntax that we didn't talk about because it's not really throw syntax, it's really in the, in the catch part. What we're doing is we're re-throwing. When we say throw, that's only legal within a catch block. And what we're saying is, Oh, throw the exception that got us here. Throw, re-throw it, right? And in this case, the thing that's thrown has been modified. Right? Because we're actually throwing that thing since we took it by reference. If we had taken it by value, we would have had a copy of it. Yeah, we could change it all we want. But a rethrow always throws the original exception, not a copy. Right? So there's one thing I want to point out. This isn't really a 2011 slide. but. There is an issue with modifying exceptions in 2011. It's actually possible that the same exception is being thrown in multiple threads. So modifying something that's in multiple threads opens up some kinds of data races. Yeah, John. What happens when the copy constructor fails in the cache? Oh, that was the other thing I was going to talk about with copy on the previous slide, right? Uh, if we, if when we're copying, there is the possibility that trying to copy this A from the actual exception, that could throw. And then you would have a situation where you're throwing when you've already got an exception in play. And we just don't want to go there. Just do not go there. So uh, I want to talk about what, what, we, what could catch this. I'm throwing an A. What could possibly catch it? Catch all. Catch all? What else? A ref. A ref? What else? Const A ref. Const A ref? Let's say CV ref, because there's a lot of flavors. You const, volatile, const, volatile. Uh, what else? Any base of A. Any public base of A, right? Anything else? 
turns out I'm being a little tricky here. A could be a type def to a pointer. Right? So a public base of A or any const, uh, excuse me, any CV qualified reference of that base, we can catch it with A or any CV qualified ref of A. Or if A is a pointer, we could catch it with a void pointer and, as John said, a catch all. Right? So that's what we can catch it. But we don't want to do this. We don't want to slice. We don't want to take a chance on throwing because of a copy. And frankly, we don't really want to copy. There's no real reason to make a copy. If anything, you could do this and just avoid the copy. Uh, but you may actually want to modify it, which means you might want to do this. But in any case, we don't want this uh, or this. So here we come to our first guideline. Throw by value, catch by reference. So I want to talk a little bit about the performance cost of this try-catch that we just talked about. And it turns out that in the success case, modern compilers can implement this so there's no time cost. Think about that. We enter a try, and as long as we never actually throw anything, no time is spent dealing with the fact that you just entered a try. Now there's a couple of caveats I want to throw at you. One is that there's no, I can't really say no cost. I can say no time cost. The truth is, the way they do this is they create a whole bunch of, of code tables in memory so that they can manage all the code paths that might actually come. So if you were in a really memory constrained situation where code bloat is significantly an issue, that might be something you want to think about. It's also true, yeah? Oh, I was also going to say, in, in Visual Studio 32-bit, uh, they haven't quite used the latest, and they can't because they're locked into binary compatibility. So they're not using this latest stuff. Even there, the overhead's not awful, but it's not quite fair to say there's no cost. But I'm going to say that anyway, because I'm going to assume that we're in 64 bit now. Yeah? So even if there's no like, explicit runtime cost, my impression was that the try catch limited the possible compiler optimizations, and so that's kind of like an implicit cost. My argument is, I'll kind of touch on this a little later. My argument is that you're actually allowing the compiler to have more optimizations. And the reason is this. Suppose I make a call, and I get some result code. And I say, oh, if this is 0, then do this. Otherwise, do this. Well, sometimes 0 means something failed, and sometimes 0 means something succeeded. right? So the compiler doesn't know which branch is the success branch. So it doesn't necessarily know which one to optimize. But when you use exceptions, all of your cleanup code and your failure code is known to the compiler because it's inside a catch block. <laughs> so it knows what not to optimize. Uh, you know, that may not actually in practice mean much. But what I'm saying is that being able to tell, you know, tell the compiler, by the way, here's my error handling stuff. Here's this other stuff. I think it's got to give the compiler writer some opportunities I, I can't quantify that. I'm not a compiler. I don't know what they're Now, I, the other thing I want to talk about is, okay, so we talked about in the success case. What about in the throw case? What about if we have a fit? Well, it turns out, I don't know, and I don't care. The point being that if we are looking at performance, we're looking at that in the, in the success case. If we've encountered an error, we are not going to do what we wanted to do. We can't. We, we couldn't get the space on memory or disk, or we couldn't talk to the server, whatever it was. So this is not the success case. So we want to optimize for the success case. In the failure case, what are we concerned about in the failure case? Recovery. Correctness. Recovery. That's right. Robustness. Those are the issues. So we optimize for the success case. And in the other case, the failure case, we, we aren't concerned about optimization. So, I do, Nevin, one of the things that when he reviewed my slides, he said, well, the problem is I have this situation where um, people call me and I have to return an answer. And even if there's, an, even if there's a failure, I have a limited period of time I've got to return an answer. So uh, he works in a, a kind of a, a weird corner of C++. Um, anyway, so the other thing I want to talk about syntax-wise is function try blocks. So here we have a function, and we've encased all the work the function. See, there's my white dot, dot, dot. See, that's not part of the standard. Not part of the language. Um, so all of the function, all the work this function does is inside a try block, and then we have this catch thing. And um, by the way, catch, it can reference A, but it can't reference B because B is no longer in scope, right? 
So the normal C++ scoping rules apply. And we have three options we can do. We can do a throw, which is really a rethrow, right? Uh, we could throw something else, or we could actually return from here, or we can just fall out. We can just end, right? But with function try blocks, we can actually do something a little different. With function try blocks, we can actually wrap the body of the function with the try and the catch. Now there are some limitations here. One of them we already can live with. That is that, yeah, we can get to the parameter, but we can't get to local things. Well, we had that situation in there. That's the same. But the language specifically says you can't return from here. You can throw, you can throw something else, you can rethrow, you can do either of those, right? And if you fall off the end, it will do the return automatically. But you can't call return. You can't say return. And that's a limitation because if you weren't returning void, there's no way to specify the return value of the function. So now we have this question, and that is, what good is this? Because we didn't have any advantages over what we were just doing, and all we had was more restrictions. Well, it turns out the only place this is any advantage is if you're trying to ask yourself, what if I wanted to catch an exception from a base class or data member construct? So if you put your try catch inside your constructor body, it's too late because base classes and data members have already been initialized. So you wouldn't be able to catch that exception. So this is the one place where a function try block might make some sense. And that is, this is the syntax, you say try colon because the, the try has to come before the colon that specifies all the initializers. And essentially what you're doing is you're putting the initializers inside the try is what you do. So you list all your initializers, both base classes and data members, and then you do whatever your constructor body does, and then you have your catch block. Notice the restrictions on the catch block. You can reference A, but you can't reference any base or member. So even though it might look like they're in scope, you cannot reference those. That's a syntax. Uh, you can modify this. Uh, you can throw a different expression, um, but an exception will be thrown. You could rethrow this, but remember when I said before, if you got to the end of this, it will return? Not so with a constructor. With a constructor, if you get to the end, it will rethrow on that. So if you think about what you can do here, you begin to realize that if you were thinking that you could capture this, fix the problem and resume, no. If an exception gets here, you're going to throw an exception. The only useful thing of a, of a function try block is that you could translate exceptions. You could take one exception and say, oh, I don't want to throw that kind of exception. I'm going to make it a different. That's the only purpose for this. How many of you have ever seen a function try block in real code? In real code? In real code, not something like this. Okay. We've got a couple. All right. The reason you don't see them much is they're not really very useful. The only thing you can do is, is this, is this uh, 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 change the exception thrown by. So now let's talk about some new syntax, right? In C++11, notice we have the cute little C++11. All right, in, in C++11, there's a couple of scenarios that we wanted to support. And the first one was because we introduced threads in the standard, so now we need to think about moving exceptions between threads. So what is that? So what we're saying is, suppose I've got a, a thread, like the main thread, and it spawns off a new thread. And so we're on this child thread, and this child thread has an exception thrown. Now there's a number of ways we could deal with this, but one way might be that we would like to have the parent thread clean up the child thread and have that exception go on past. Unfortunately, because it's on a different thread, that can't be managed. So we had to figure out a way of dealing with that. The other thing is called nested exceptions. And I don't really like that name because it seems weird to me. I think of it as stack exceptions. So here's what it means. What it means is, suppose an exception comes up and, I, and I've captured, I've caught that exception, right? And what I want to do is I want to put a, my own exception on top of that and throw them both so that a handler at the higher level can handle my exception, and then after handling my exception, rethrow the one underneath. And so that's what we want to be able to do is stack these exceptions and handle them in a first out, uh, a last in, first out sort of way, right? All right, so let's talk about the moving exceptions between threads. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to capture the exception. 
Uh, we can't do that now. We can catch, but that's not capturing the exception. That's handling the exception. So that's different. Then we need a way that we can move the exception, just like any other object, so we can move it between threads. Now, moving data between <coughs> threads off, you know, opens up some, you know, data race kinds of things and things. But, but we want to be able to handle that somehow. And then once we get it on the thread we want, we want to be able to rethrow it as if it hadn't been caught. It's just continue its way. So it turns out that the capturing part's easy. There's a new thing in, in the exception header that uh, says a new function called current exception, and it returns an exception pointer. So what's an exception pointer? An exception pointer is, most importantly, it's copy. Right? It's a new smart pointer in the standard library. And uh, what it says is that as long as any pointer, remember it's copyable, as long as any copy points to the exception, the exception still exists. And we can copy this between threads like any other data. And when I say like any other data, I mean you know, concerned about whatever sequencing or sequ synchronization or any other issues. Right? So we could write code like this. Somewhere we have some global or high level uh, exception. It's just a pointer, so we can pass it null pointer. Um, it would actually destruct, it would, that would be the default, but I just try to throw it in there because I like to be all C++ 11. Um, so then we do whatever we want to do, we catch, and then we can just call current exception, and whatever the, notice, it doesn't matter what the current exception is, it, it puts it into our exception pointer, so that after we finish doing whatever cleanup we want, we can also say, oh, if there was an exception, there's other things we want to do. And what that might mean is, oh, we want to, cap, we want to pass that exception off to somebody else, or whatever we want. So, Capturing it and moving it around are, are pretty simple and straightforward. So what about rethrowing? Well, it turns out that's easy too. So exception again has this new function called rethrow exception, and it allows us to throw an exception point. Now, notice this is a pointer to an exception, not a standard exception, right? We don't know the type of this exception. It could be an int, it could be a double, it could be anything. Well, it has to be copied, right? But it could be anything. We can't query it, we can't do anything with it. The only thing we can do is we can pass the pointer around and we can rethrow. But that turns out that's all we need. So I want to show one other example of, uh, of moving exceptions between threads. So some of you may have uh, already seen uh, calls to async, right? So here's a function that might throw. By the way, why do we think it might throw? Because we, unless we know differently, we always assume it might throw, right? So. Um, in this case, we're, we're throwing, that means we're returning a future int, because this returns an int, so we're going to return a future int, and this can't possibly do, this isn't going to throw, because all we've done is we've put this async, uh, calling it async. The function, if it does throw, async is going to use, is going to capture whatever it throws, and, and make a current exception pointer out of it, so that when you call get, when you call get, Either it's already waiting for us or we block. That's, I'm not going to go much into futures. I, I hope you guys know about futures. If you don't, you'll, you'll be in a session before the end of the week. Um, but the point is that when it gives us the int, it first checks to say, oh, by the way, did this throw? And if it did, it throws here. Right? So that might be time delay because this may have thrown and be a long, long time before you finally call get. So the exception may have happened and a long time before you call it. Or the reverse may happen. You may call get, and you're blocked on it until finally you throw. But either way, uh, I just want to show you that that's how we handle, that's how async handles exception. All right, now let's talk about, again, nesting exceptions, or what I like to call a stacking exception. So what are we going to do? So the first thing we have to do, remember the scenario, we're handling an exception, then we're going to put our exception on top of it, and then throw them both, and then process ours and rethrow the, the one below them. Or Possibly multiple ones. Right? So um, that's what we need to do. First, we're going to nest. Then we're going to throw a new exception with the nested one. And then we've got to figure out how we can pull that nested one out and rethrow it. Yeah? Sorry, one step back. Hit current exception pointer. Is that like one for the process? It's the one you're handling, right? So you're in a catch when you call that. Mm -hmm. right? You don't want to call that when you're not in a catch because there is no current exception. So if you're in a catch block, there's some exception that you're handling. Mm -hmm. That's the one it gives you. Even though another thread may have thrown just a split second right after that one. Well, it depends on if they throw that same object. Actually, threads, multiple threads throwing the same exact object, we can do that, but I'm not certain that people are going to do that. 
The same uh, okay, not the same, not two instances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So um, I'm not the threat expert. We have to, we'll have to you know, defer to the guys that are doing the threat construct. I'm just throwing it out there because there are people on the committee who say, yeah, this is the thing, we didn't like it. Mm -hmm. Because in, in C03, if you get an exception, you can assume you own it. Right. In 11, you can assume you might own it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, are exceptions copied when you do the throw? So isn't it not really possible that two throws, throws would you have the same exception? Um, I'm going to ask you to talk to Alice about that. <laughs> Um, the issue has to do with um, being able to get to the copy constructors at certain times. And whether they're, they're to, I don't know what the issues are. I just know I'm not worried about it. I don't think people are going to be looking for the exact same. Um, I don't know. Yeah. So if you catch, so if you get it at the current exception and then rethrow it, catch that by reference, modify it, and then rethrow it again. Have you? Rethrown the modified object, or are you modifying the copy? Um, you have rethrown the modified object. Okay. When I say the copy happens, the copy moves it from the throw statement to some magic place that the that the, that the standard doesn't tell us. It could be some global spot that's been, you know, or maybe there's some. You know. And why are we worried about that copy? Um, theoretically, it could, but. Yeah, um, you know, if you make an exception that has six megabytes of data numbers and you try to copy it, yeah. then you're going to be in trouble. Exceptions tend to be lightweight; they may have a string and they not, but they tend to be fairly lightweight. And also, the implementations generally have allocated a certain amount of memory specifically for exceptions. Um, I've done some discussing about this, but what I found out is that every compiler does their own little thing. They all have different ideas about it, and they change over time. So I'm not really trying to be an expert in that because. Why wouldn't that be a, an implicit move? It's just like the scenario where you're returning a locally declared variable. So you know you're going out of scope. The compiler can elide the copy, and I think almost all of them do. I'm just saying the standard seems to specify that there. Are you know, it's possible that I missed that, and it does. But I don't know that it does. It's it's a real logical thing because I, if it doesn't, it's probably because everybody elides it anyway, and so they didn't. Maybe never occurred. But I don't know that it does. It would be, it'd make a lot of sense to me. Write up a defect report and <laughs> give it to Alex. No, give it to him. How about that? Um, so where were we? Okay, so this is what we need to do. We need to nest the current one. We need to, we need to uh, throw the new exception in the nest, and then we want to, okay, I think we can throw this, right? So it turns out that there's a, a new type defining an exception that's called nested exception. And in its constructor, Standard doesn't say it does this, but if you read the standard, it's pretty clear this is what it's doing. Implicitly, it's calling current exception, and then it's holding the result. So just constructing this object grabs this so that it so that the nested exception has the current exception as a data unit. So all you have to do is instantiate nested exception, but it turns out that you never instantiate nested exception. And the reason is because there's this function that's also an exception. And it's called throw with nested. Notice this is a template, right? So you create your own exception, whatever it is, my exception. And when you call throw with nested, what it does is it creates that nested exception that we just talked about. And when it creates the nested exception, that goes out and it grabs the current exception. Then what it does is it throws a new exception. Remember, this is done at compile time because it's a template. It throws a type that is multiply inherited. It's inherited both from the type you just created, your exception, and from standard exception. Now remember, how do we catch? Type. By reference, right? So if we catch by reference, the fact is multiply inherited doesn't matter. As long as both of these base classes are public, which they are, we can catch an exception by saying, oh, I want a reference to T. Right? So let me show you how this might look. Yeah. I was going to say that the fact that they use a perfect forwarding parameter there, uh -huh. I would think implies that they thought about moving to the exceptions. So yeah, I'm going to yeah. I'm going to look this up. I got to have that. Wait, what the heck? Um, um, that's true. But 
Okay, so this is how we might do an estimate exception. So the, notice there's two try blocks here. So at the lower level, we catch some exception, whatever that is, and then we say, oh, I want a, a my exception pushed on top of whatever the current is, right? So this is the throw with nested. And what does throw with nested do? It creates a nested exception, which captures the current one, and then creates a new type that's multiply derived from my exception and nested exception, and it throws that. So we can catch, by reference, my exception. Then we handle my exception, then what do we do? Now this is the tricky part. We have to check to see if this is in fact nested, because we might have thrown somewhere down here where it wasn't nested. Right? So that's the first thing. Check to see if it's nested. Then we have to extract the contained exception. Remember, the nested exception is a new standard type. That's not what we want to throw. We want to throw the current exception that's inside of nested. That's what we want to get. And then we want to throw that. Well, we already know how to throw. So this part's easy, right? You're going to end up by calling that, right? Well, maybe. Um, it turns out that there's yet another new thing. In fact, it does all the steps at once. Exception declares something called rethrow if nested. And you pass it the type that you've got. And it's going to do all three steps we just talked about. What it's going to do is, it's going to say, uh, wait a minute, is this derived from nested exception? And if it, if it is, then we're going to extract that thing and we're going to throw it. And so here's what the code looks like. Rethrow if nested, right? So, they're doing all the heavy work for you. If you actually want to stack exceptions, it's not that hard. I'm not certain people are going to do that. Online. I know it's used a lot in Java and stuff. Yeah? You cannot derive from the nested exception. I don't know why you couldn't. I mean, if you wanted to. I'd say let it do it, but is that your question? What's that? What if you have a separate catch bar for a nested exception? Well, it, okay, so let's say you say, oh, I want to catch uh, this, and I'm going to catch minus, etc. If you had something that derives from both, it's going to be caught in the first one. Oh, it that, yeah, it, it does them in order, right? And, uh, so I got a couple questions. Yeah. What happens if you don't uh, do this rethrow of nested? You just get it ignored. You ignore the original exception. Yeah, I mean, that's going to go out of scope, and when it goes out of scope, the, uh, okay. the yeah, right. it's just going to go out of scope. Uh, hang on a second, there's a question. What would be the use case for this? Are there any Java programmers here? <laughs> Anybody willing to admit they're Java? Don't you guys use this? No, C, -sharp. C Sharp uses it. Oh, sorry. Asking the wrong group. Okay. But it's used in C Sharp. And it, it makes sense, right? I mean, I don't know the use case. I'm sorry. I don't know the use yeah, okay. case. Okay. Um, Java, you don't rethrow the nested thing. Uh -huh. It's basically a way to add more information as you go up the application stack. Oh, we have a different way of doing that. We'll talk about that. All right, right. Um, does nested exception um, inherit from STD exception? No, it's no, no. It's a no. It's a standalone thing. It's, it's a, in a different context. So does this mean that that is in the method to handle uh, nested exception and accept say user function? Um, well, you have that situation now. Not everything throws is derived from nested. If all of the exceptions you work with derive from nested exception, then just catching nested ex er, I'm sorry. If all of the if all of your code base's exceptions derive from standard exception, then catching standard exception is going to catch this nested exception. Because remember, it's also got yours. You never well, I shouldn't say never. The system won't do it for you. You could create a nested exception and throw it. But that's just exactly the same as creating a string or an int. So I don't think it I don't think it causes us any headaches we didn't have already. But it's not the nested exception isn't used in the standard library, but thrown by the standard. Oh no 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 no! It's only used by this uh, you know, rethrow if nested or uh, no throw with nested. That's, yeah. So uh, this is this, my exception is now a base. My exception used to be written as a base class, then, right? This is the yes. thing that gets generated to this. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, it's not like the capture. Yeah. I mean. You gotta follow all of the kind of the conventions. Yeah. Yeah. Does that mean that you need to make sure that your exception class is all over to construct constructors? Right. Yeah. Um because that's one of the conditions between the base. Yeah. It's well I 
think you would have to. And the exception itself is going to be cleaned up, and I assume it's going to be cleaned up by calling its destructor, and if it's not virtual. Um, yeah. Good question. Boy. I mean, okay. you, yeah. you could get around it like we get around it with smart pointers and things of that sort, too, where we actually delete the real thing as opposed to the thing we think we might have. Just saying there's tricks. Yeah, there's, okay, yeah, okay. Well, so the boost crowd can come to your rescue, too. Um, so where are we? Okay, so I want to talk about a couple of standard handlers. But actually, it's a great question. Yeah? And I'm really sorry nobody actually asked this question, but how many times can you nest? <laughs> I was going to. But. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know. Stack. How many levels? Yeah. Calling it a stack implies you should do it a lot. I don't know. Okay. Uh, I don't know of any limitation. When I read about the standard, it didn't limitation. <laughs> Company-based classes can you inherit from? Yeah. yeah, well, also... Somebody try it now. As I say, that different implementations sometimes have different strategies for handling memory. At least in theory, you could run out of exception memory, but... Yeah. I mean, you know, it's one of these things that, you know, how, how many stack calls can you make? I mean, there's a point at which things that we don't worry too much about actually start to worry about. Yeah? So you said uh, that this type that gets thrown is inherits from you, your exception type that you threw. Yes. And the nested exception, right? Yes. yes. They might have guaranteed that they don't need their, this type's destructor doesn't need any calls. I mean, it, it might be yeah. that's, 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 that's the base. That's true. The structure is being called a sufficient, so it doesn't need to be ripple. Uh, yeah, except that the nested exception object is going to have this uh, pointer, so it needs to make sure that it's it's going to have this exception pointer, which is going to have to go instead. You know, to Otherwise, that exception. Will be okay, so I want to talk about a couple of handlers. These are handlers that that the system has and writes for you, but you can write your own. So let's talk first about terminal. So the standard terminate handler just calls standard. So you call terminate, you're saying, hey, game's over. We're calling the board. Now, we can write our own terminate handler. And there's some cool things we can do in the terminate handler. Like, we can, uh, uh, we can log that we're about to abort. In fact, if you really want it to be insane, um, you know, it's illegal to call main. You can't call main in your own code. I think it works in most implementations. But, but the standard says you can't call it. But you could have main do nothing except call some do main or something like that. And you could call it. In other words, you could restart your app, essentially, from within a terminate. Your globals might be in an interesting situation, but uh, theoretically you can do it. But in practice, the truth is, uh, once you call terminate, the one thing you'd like to do, perhaps, but can't do is, you can't fix something and then resume. That you can't do. And so basically that means you don't want to call terminate. Unexpected turns out to be really similar because it calls the terminate handler. And that calls abort, and that ends your program. Now, there are some other things we can do and unexpected, but generally speaking, what we can't do is we can't resume. Now, one thing we can do is uh, unexpected gets called when an exception is thrown. We can rethrow a different exception. So there are some things we can do, but we can't do what we want to do. The, the upshot of this slide is you don't want to be here, and you don't want to be here. So how do we get to uh, calling the unaccepted handler? Well, this is called when you throw an exception outside of the dynamic exception specification, which we haven't really talked about yet, so let's talk about it. Exception specification. Okay, now we're down the 2003 lane, because there's two flavors. This is the 2003. Um, it defines exception, exception specifications. Now we call them dynamic exception specifications. Okay? And then this is 2011. We have two flavors again. Uh, uh, the 2011 flavor, it introduces no accept, and it deprecates dynamic exception specifications. Okay. All right, so let's go back to 2003 and look. Uh, first of all, if we don't say anything about a function, it may throw anything. Well, that makes it consistent with what our accept assumption is, right? We don't know anything about it, we assume it throws, right? Um, we have this syntax where we say throw, and then we list types, comma-separated types, which may be an empty list, right? One or more, or zero or more types. And what we're saying is this may throw A or B, and I should point out, you could throw something derived from A or something derived from B. Okay? Um, and then this syntax is saying, oh, this may not throw. So this is the dynamic exception specification. Here's the thing, and here's why they're deprecated. 
it turns out these are not checked at compile time. So when you first read about it, you say, oh, this is great. If I call a function that could be throwing something, the compiler will tell me if I don't handle what it throws. And I go back to Java. C++ doesn't work that C++ has this attitude. So in the vector implementation, there's, an, there's a function called act. And it works uh, to give you, you pass in the index of the item you want, and it returns it like a, you know, uh, just like you'd expect. But if you call and pass a value that's beyond what the vector actually has, you give it an invalid index because it's too large, an exception will be true. So the point is that this is a situation where a function is throwing an exception, however, it's possible for you to call the function in a way that guarantees that will not throw. And that's the assumption the compiler makes when it sees you're calling a function that could throw and you're not handling the throw. So that's why it doesn't give you an error. It says, oh, you must be calling it in a way that you know it won't throw. And by making that assumption, it means that compile time checking isn't happening for it. But at runtime it happens, because remember we said, if you throw an exception that's not in your specification, you're going to call unexpected. And what do we say about calling unexpected? Don't you don't want to be. So it turns out that there's runtime overhead and no compile time help. That doesn't sound like the kind of feature we want, so that's why it's deprecated. And that leads us to, oh my. <laughs> that leads us to the next guideline, which is do not use dynamic exception specifications. So in 2003, where they're not deprecated, still don't use them. In 2011, they're deprecated, so definitely. So let's talk about no exception. Okay, so this is a new keyword in C++, and you know the standard committee. Boy, if they got a keyword, they're going to use it every time they can. So there's two uses for it. One is as an exception specification, which is what we're talking about. But they also have this new thing called the no accept operator. So we'll talk about both of them. Let's talk first about the exception specification. So um, just like the uh, dynamic specif exception specification, if you don't list anything, it may throw anything. Well, we needed that for backward compatibility, right? So now we have this new thing where we say no accept, and then we give it a Boolean const expert, right? And it turns out that if this is true, then what you're saying is this will not throw. And if this is false, you're saying that eh, it might throw, okay? And notice that there is another form where we don't say anything and it defaults to true. And there's something new, and that is destructors are no accept by default. And Evan wanted me to point out, he says, well, it's not necessarily true. Because destructors are only no accept if your base class and data member destructors are also no accept. But understand, they were all accept by default, no accept by default. So the only way you could be not no accept is if somewhere along the line, somebody actually wrote a destructor and then said, no accept false. You'd have to really want it to be. So by default, acceptors are all no accept. All right, so let's look at it as an operator. So I've wrapped it in static assert, but let's ignore that for a second. We say no accept two plus three. So the standard has a bunch of things, like uh, size of and type of, and things like this, where you give it an expression, and the compiler doesn't actually evaluate the expression. In other words, when you do this, the compiler doesn't ever actually calculate what two plus three is. That's not what it's doing. If you said size of two plus three, what would it do? It would say, oh, the result of this, I don't know what it is, but the result of it is an int, and it will return size of int. So it's doing the same thing here. It's saying, I'm not actually going to add 2 and 3. I'm just going to look at it and say, could that throw? And it can't throw. So the answer is true. This is no accept. It won't throw. And I didn't put the message in here, but, but this is true. All right. And then this, I put a not in front of it, because I think that might throw. That would be my guess. And so, the, so no accept is going to say false. We not that, so this statement is true, right? Yes? Yeah, it's in the standard. No, I know. That's my preference. It's the same as a bang. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so we have uh, int foo. And because it's in line, we can look at it, and we can see, oh, that's not going to throw. So we say, no accept foo. Is this, uh, is this going to fail? This assert is going to fail or going to pass? Yeah. Why is it going to fail? We know it can't throw. Yes. Yes. 
the truth is that even though I threw you off, I deliberately tried to fool you by making this inline, the truth is that because the compiler can't always look inside a function. In other words, this could just be a header, and there's some other translation unit that actually provides an implementation. So if that was the case, the compiler couldn't look inside that implementation. So in order to be consistent, instead of making some weird rule that says, well, if it's inline, or if I've already seen it, no. The rule is, I don't actually look inside functions, I only look at how they're declared. Right? So if we want this assertion to pass, we need to actually, we need to actually say no accept. So is that is that truly the implementation of the no expect op operator? It, it, that's exactly what it does. It looks at the function signature and yes or no on no accept. Um, it, well, it looks at the entire expression, and when it comes to a function used in the expression, it only looks at the signature. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, what are we doing here? Can you oh. overload on no accept? Uh, I don't think, I think no accept is the same as, it, as dynamic accept specification, which means it's not actually part of the signature. I believe that's the case. Um, that, I, I never cared for dynamic signatures, so I didn't care. But I do care about this, so I should know that. So that's a really good question that I don't know. Uh, but I believe the answer is that uh, it's not part of the signature, and therefore it's ignored for overall uh, Where are we? How will no accept be used, operator? Uh, Oh, okay. So, I so there's the op, so there's the operator form. I think might be used in certain cases, particularly in uh, in templates, where we may check to see, for example, if there's move operations, and it can do one thing if there's move. Otherwise, it has to do a more expensive thing. I think the unconditional form, as an exception specification, will probably be used in simple types, meaning non-templated types. But I think in templated types, it's likely that we may use the that the specification form will call the operator form to figure out what operations on the template parameter are no accept to figure out whether these operations are no accept. Does that make sense? Oh, wow. So what it's saying is, what do we call this, by the way, when we derive from the template parameter? Oh, curiously recurring. Curious, okay. Yeah. Curiously recurring. Curiously recurring uh, template pattern. Anyway, so in this case, we are saying that the constructor is no accept if this base class constructor is no accept. Right? So there's nothing going on in foo. Whatever foo does, it's not going to throw by itself. It all depends on whether this goes. Right? So by the way, Nevin says don't speculate, and I just speculate. I'm just telling you how I think it will be used. OK, so remember we had this guideline. It's a flashback. Do not use exception specifications, but do use no accept. So let's talk about terminate. We, we did unexpect. Let's talk about the terminate. Um, uh, when is terminate called? Actually, we've got some more. Terminate is called uh, when we rethrow and there is no exception. In other words, when we're not inside that catch block <coughs> and we say throw without specifying what we do. That calls terminate. If we are in a no accept function and we throw, that calls terminate. And um, if we throw when there's already an exception being thrown. John? Yeah. Is it not still the case that terminate is also called if an exception is never caught all the way up the stack? Uh, uh, That's the normal thing. No, I'm, I'm not saying this is exhaustive. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm outlining the things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's true. I think that's absolutely true. Okay. If, it, if it can't handle it, it it's uh, unhandled exception. Uh, right. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't call terminate. It's, uh, it's undefined. Now. This is what. Uh, Oh, well, it used to call terminate. <laughs> I, think it, I think it calls terminate on all major platforms, but we're going to check the standard, but it's a might be somebody here who knows Okay, so let's talk about how we don't terminate. Well, uh, the first thing is uh, don't rethrow outside of a catch block. Well, that's pretty obvious. Most of the time we know if we're in a catch block, so that's not a big deal. But we don't want to throw from a no accept function. Well. Yeah, it's possible we could screw something up through maintenance or something, but for the most part, we can control that. Sorry, sorry, the, the, the retro. I was going to say, in the case of the nested exceptions, where you can look at the exception outside of the catch block, retro. That's because an exception pointer got yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and by the way, I didn't mention, I don't know if it's coming up. Um, with an exception pointer, remember I said you can call rethrow 
We throw exception on the exception pointer. If the exception pointer is null, and you call that, guess what? That's the same thing as saying rethrow outside of it. It's going to call terminate. Mm -hmm. So what about this? Don't throw an exception as being thrown. Well, okay, let's think about uh, let's think about this. Um, when an exception is thrown, we go from the throw to the catch. There isn't any code in between. How could we possibly do that? How could we do that if we wanted to? When an exception is thrown, then it gets caught. There's no code in between. The structures. Remember we said, remember I said that string that was really long, you know, that's going to have its destructor called and any local objects on the stack and any of those. So those will all get cleaned up. So um, it turns out that uh, that our destructors are called in the case where they've put them, where we've put them on the stack, and uh, we're cleaning up. So that leads us to this guideline: destructors must not throw. That is, they must deliver the no-throw guarantee. Internally, they can throw, but they must not emit. Right? That's what I say down here. Uh, that means cleanup must be safe. So remember when I said before that we're okay with the fact that almost all our code throws. Functions throw. We we live with it. This is the exception. Cleanup must be safe. As a general thing, if you think about it, we are handling you know, all these things that might run into runtime errors. <coughs> we can't do that if we can't make the assumption that some things are safe, and what the safe has to be is the clean. So that's the lesson, right? So let's start talking about uh, safe objects. And I want to talk about object lifetimes. Let's talk about the order of construction. I've got some class, and let's say it's all about it. It's got base classes, it's got data members, it's got the whole thing, right? What, what's the order of construction of this monster when I say new this thing? What happens? The base class? No, no. The memory. Base class object. Base class object, right? Yeah. Um, what order if I have multiple bases? Declaration order. That's right, I didn't have that. Um, it turns out that we go uh, left to right as listed in the type package, right? Then what's next? Member objects. All right, data members, all right. In what order? In the order they appear in the definition. The order they appear in the constructor initializer order, right? No. 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 <laughs> as listed in the type definition top of bottom. <clears throat> not as listed in the constructor initializer list. Why not? <clears throat> Yeah, we'll limit the pile. We have to keep track. Each object has to keep track of its own initialization order, which is pretty ugly. That's true, but why would it have to keep track of its own initialization order? Because everything has to be destroyed in the opposite order of construction. Exactly. It's because of that. So, what Lior was saying is that there's a fundamental rule about C, and we rely on it absolutely. And it's deterministic destruction order. And that is that things get destroyed in the reverse order they got created. So, imagine that I have a an object with two constructors, which I could have, and imagine that they both have initializer lists, which they could have, and imagine the initializer lists are in different order. That means that when I destroy an object of that type, I would have to know which constructor it was constructed by so that I would know which order to destroy everything. That means that every object has got to carry some state with it. No, we're not going there. We need a single order of construction and this is a source of some bugs, because sometimes people think that they can write constructors and initialize members in the order that they put them. So if there's some kind of dependency, they can rely on that order. So that's why I call this out. Those programmers should be executed and not their code. <laughs> you know, I'm willing to forgive that. I've got much better things to execute. Here um, Fair enough. So anyway, then the next, oh, I, I, I didn't wait to ask the question. What's next is the constructor block. Okay. So, um, Lior has already answered this question. What is the order of destruction? The fact that there's not much room left on the slide means it's a pretty simple answer. Backwards. The exact order that it got destructed, constructed, except going the other way, right? Okay, so now it's the question, is this big religious thing that, that, that programmers have debated forever, and that is, when does an object's lifetime begin? After construction. What? Apparently at the end of the construction. After construction. 
after construction, but most importantly, yes, at the end of the constructor body. It turns out this is not as theoretical a question as you might. Uh, it will come out to be an important thing in just a second. I want to now talk about aborted construction, right? Now, what does that mean? That means that we've thrown a constructor, uh, thrown from the constructor of a base class, a data member, or the constructor body, right? And the question now is, if this happens, what do we need to clean up? So I'm writing my class. I'm assuming that base classes and data members, they're written right, but I'm writing my class. What do I need to worry about? Do I need to worry about the base class objects, cleaning that up if it throws from the, the constructor? No. If it's a properly written base class, it takes care of itself. I don't have to worry about that. What about data members? Yes. Yes? Depends. Depends. Well, I mean, if, they, if, they if you have a pointer, or pointing with something. Constructor body. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, clear that. It turns out that data members are really just like base classes, which is if a data member is being constructed and it throws, it's the responsibility of the data member, that object, to clean itself. Right? Several members and we constructed two or three of them and it threw some yes. down and now yes. it's just okay, so yes, okay, that's the exact same. Okay. Let's say we have several members. We call the first one gets constructed okay, then the next one gets constructed okay. Then we're in one and there's a problem and it throws. How do we clean up the other two data members? Well it turns out we clean those up exactly the same way we clean up the base classes, which is that the implementation, meaning the, the uh, uh, the new operator has to check and see and watch whatever's getting cleaned up so that it can reverse the process, right? So the point is that all we need to worry about is the constructor body because bases and data members are also themselves only worried about their constructor body. And if everybody gets their constructor body right, we're okay. But why is the constructor body an issue? It's because we need to clean up anything we did here because the destructor will not be called. Why? It wasn't completely constructed. Right. Because the object lifetime never began. Because we aborted construction. We did not finish the constructor body. Which means the object itself doesn't live. That means the destructor doesn't attach. That means the destructor is not going to get called. That means it's up to us to clean up anything we do inside the constructor. In particular, because the, the constructor, the, the object may not be in a safe state to run the destructor. Well, yes, that's the why the destructor, that's why it's designed the way it is, but, and that's a good reason, but we don't need to know that. All we need to know is the rules say the destructor doesn't equal. But you're absolutely right. Helps me not Calling the destructor on a partially created object <laughs> might be more dangerous. Yeah. That's good. No, 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 no. When I say the constructor body, I mean the constructor body. The initializer list are the base class objects in data. Um, if somebody else after that has, yeah, you don't want to have independent independent data members in that state. Yeah, if you, yes. Don't get ahead of me. What other questions do we have? And and before you ask the question, ask yourself: Is it worth staying over? Because we're just at four. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, the case where one of your data members is a pointer, okay, to some stack memory. You successfully allocate that, and then later on, uh, something throws. Right. That's just exactly what we were talking about. Okay. Um, you yes. If if you successfully create a new object that doesn't go into some kind of smart pointer or some kind of handler, then you have an issue. Um, where was I? I was going to ask you about array. Let's get through this, and then I'll, I'll let you guys take a break. And what was the question I was going to look at? Moving. Uh, on throws, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, what if I'm annuing an array? Do I have to do special cleanup for that? No. It'll back it out, last in, first out, if it's an array of um, value, uh, value types, yeah. Um, it turns out that the rule here is just the same as with all these, which is that if something is completely constructed, then the uh, then the, then the implementation will see to it that it's destroyed properly and release the memory that it holds. Um, but what we need to be concerned about is when something throws it in the constructor body, that's what we need. That's all we need. 
anything that is a, a standalone object that was completely constructed, the implementation will see to it that it's constructed. Now, what about the memory of the object itself? I've got such a great story to tell you about this. Um, and we will start that at 4 30. John? If I can just uh, oh, yeah. follow up on an open question we had, I just looked it up in the standard. Yes. Terminate is still called on an unhandled exception. Terminate is, is still called on still an called unhandled, unhandled exception. Okay. All right. Anybody else want to look up my standard question? Yeah. Uh -huh. We need to clap. Yeah, I know. Let's just do it. Yeah.